In August 1962, I made a little film with four unknown kids in a Liverpool cellar. Soon, the Beatles had conquered much of the world. But back in the USSR, the repressive old men in the Kremlin tried to resist the Fab Four. They were defeated by their children. This is the untold story of how the Beatles helped to destroy communism. Beatles turned tens of millions of young people into another religion. And the understanding that we are living in a monster state and we needed an alternative. Every Russian schoolboy wants to be a star, playing Beatles music, making a guitar. They changed everything and um, they opened the whole world. It was all brought by, by them, uh, by the Beatles. И спасибо Beatles, которые внесли свою посильную лепту в развал этой империи. They destroyed the communism. More than Gorbachev, by the way. They, they changed the Soviet Union. Beatles, it was the key that opened door to the West culture. West culture produced cultural revolution, cultural revolution destroyed Soviet Union. Even Comrade Brezhnev sadly shook his head. Each comrade's child was in a band. Yeah, yeah, virus swept the land. Yeah, yeah, virus mm. swept the land. Things were getting out of hand. But the first hole in the Iron Curtain, the songs of Beatles. The Beatles were always looked upon as very dangerous, bourgeois, somehow undermined in the system itself. What could they do? What could they say? Generation got astray. The Beatles, it was like a fresh air. In Russia, it was amazing power because they had this free spirit. Слушали эту музыку и, и спасали, переставали быть рабами совка. Вот чего они боялись. Over the years, I heard stories, incredible at first, about how the Beatles had changed the lives of millions of kids and how their music helped to destroy official culture and the communist system. In today's Moscow, the vast socialist experiment feels like a dream. But how could four lads from Liverpool have played a part in defeating the Cold War enemy? I knew the Beatles had never been able to play behind the Iron Curtain. A repressive and puritanical youth culture was strictly enforced by a state which feared what the Beatles might bring. But wherever I went, people insisted the Beatles had a more profound impact on rocking the Kremlin than the threat from the West of nuclear missiles or anti-communist crusading. In the big bad west they've had whole huge institutions 
which spend uh, tens of millions of dollars for undermining the Soviet system. And I'm sure that the impact of all those stupid Cold War institutions has been much, much smaller than uh, the impact of, uh, of the Beatles. If you look at all the factors that led to the ultimate loss of belief in the system, which was its downfall, it was held together by fear and by belief. And the Beatles played a role in, first of all, overcoming the fear and in showing that the belief was actually stupid. Across the USSR, the Beatles virus spawned hundreds of tribute bands. Their music was my soundtrack as I went looking for the Beatles' generation to follow the story of an improbable revolution. Kolya Vasin is Russia's ultimate Beatles fan. Adventures. Beatles gave me adventures all my life. For more than 40 years, he's been building his John Lennon Temple of Love in St. Petersburg. Music! Another life. With the Beatles, another life. Моя душонка детская, вот тогда, когда мне было 18 лет, когда первый услышал Битлз, она вылетела на, на, на свет. Я начал летать, flying with the Beatles. Я полюбил Битлз, они стали моими друзьями, братьями по духу. Since 1964, when he first heard a bootleg Beatles tape, Kolya Vasin has been amassing his hoard of Beatles treasure. Для меня это спасение души, а не а не балдёжи, не не торч, не там время препровождения, не хобби какое-то, понятно? My temple стал как бы результатом всего этого. Я боялся этого, я действительно боялся. И вся моя жизнь прошла при совке в страхе. Потому что, я, я повторяю, было колоссальнейшее давление пропаганды. Они так поливали Битлов, так, так обижали нашу любимую группу, что я боялся за себя, что вот если я что-нибудь скажу за Битлс, меня могут арестовать. For Kolya Vasin and millions of other kids, it was never easy to be a Beatles fan in the Soviet Union. Reviled by the communist authorities as Western pollution, Beatles records were banned. Vigilantes patrolled the streets, rounding up rock and roll fans and shaving off their long hair. Police at airports kept a lookout for smuggled records. You just bring it into the country, actually. It's like contraband, you know, just you're bringing this album knowing you're not supposed to bring this stuff into the country. So, and they will find it in your luggage. They will scratch it. And it was devised like three nails together, you know, just to scratch it, because it should be done in a proper way. Official Soviet culture ignored the Beatles' invasion, preferring accordions and folk dancing to guitars and the Fab Four. You know, being a young, a radical man, I just hated all this because it was all totally square, totally uncool. All the singers had wrong haircuts. 
they were dressed like office clerks and they sang like Brezhnev at the Communist Party Congress. Soviet culture has been totally unsexy, very rigid, too limited. There was nothing bright and free and funky and sexy and funny about it. And of course, uh, these qualities were exactly the vitamins that our bodies needed. In the mid-60s, ingenious Beatles fans found a way to make their own bootlegs. Their secret weapons were street-side recording booths where homesick soldiers could make sound letters for their moms. After hours, fans would turn up with tapes of Beatles songs illicitly recorded from Radio Luxembourg. And you could do the recording of Beatles songs. At the beginning, they did it on the um, used X-rays, which they collected from trash in the medical institutes or in clinics or hospitals. And so there was the machine with the needle, which was scratching grooves on this X-rays. A black market mushroomed fed by records on ribs. So kids could listen to I Feel Fine on Uncle Sergei's lungs. I used to buy ribs when I was a kid. There was a guy keeping it in a sleeve, flexible, flexi discs. So they had, because it was prohibited, in his sleeve, flexes, three rubles. Okay. You want a shakes, you want a rock and rolls. Shake was dance, you know, shake. You want some rock and rolls? You want some shakes? Three rubles. What's this? It's good rock and roll. This was very dangerous for people who sold it. It was prohibited. Shrugging off official disapproval, the Beatles virus raged across the Soviet Empire. In Minsk, 500 miles from Moscow, Yuri Pelyushinok caught the bug. But yeah, 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 yes, and it's so awfully good, you know, and so nice that you fall in love when you hear this. And you can just feel it, you know, it's, it's in the air. I can't I can explain you. But everybody, everybody knows it. It's like an, uh, if mom, my mom would like to tell me to, to, to have a haircut, she would say, you're worse than a beetle, you know? По-моему, немножко много. Он фанат Битлов. Не то, что недоразумение, а нужно было и другими делами заниматься. А он, когда рос, для него Битлы – это были боги. In Kiev, too, the Beatles virus was unstoppable. Nikolai Poturayev was a schoolboy back then. They opened the whole world. And in fact, my decision to uh, go to the university, to the Faculty of English Language and Literature, and my interest to um, English spoken culture, it was all brought by, by them, uh, by the Beatles. And you know, this feeling of uh, feeling of freedom. It's like you meet friends after a long uh, period of being alone. In St. Petersburg, Sergei Ivanov caught the Beatles virus. The boy who would grow up to be Russian defense supremo and Vladimir Putin's deputy prime minister confesses he still has symptoms of the infection he caught more than 40 years ago. That was 62-63. I was a kid, around 10 or 11 years age. Average Soviet kid. And uh, I tuned to the radio station and heard music. I suspect it was Love Me Do. Still remember that. Then the Beatlemania started, including the Soviet Union, by the way. 
In that sense, the Soviet Union was a normal European country. Except one thing, <laughs> the Beatles didn't come. <laughs> of course, the Soviet Union was far from a normal country, and the young Ivanov was probably tuned illicitly to Radio Luxembourg. But ignoring official hostility, Soviet kids continued to track down Beatles music. I became a Beatles fan. I know most of their songs. I still remember them. And hearing the Beatles music, I'm sure now, it helped me to learn English language properly. I woke up and uh, dragged my, uh, I made my bed, dragged a comb across my head. That was the first time I learned what the word comb means in Russian. <laughs> By the way, I still remember that. In the Soviet Union, official propaganda was one thing, but uh, real life was totally different. The Beatles became such a phenomenal thing in the Soviet Union because they came in the very right time with the very right kind of music. The timing uh, has been perfect because, say, if it happened uh, two or three years earlier, i.e. in the very beginning of the 60s, I think that uh, their music would fall on a far less fertile ground. In 61, 62, we've had a very powerful agenda of our own in the Soviet Union. We've had our own global superhero, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. And we've had, uh, you know, this also long-haired, and bearded uh, romantic uh, revolutionaries in Cuba. We've had our own charismatic leader, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, who promised uh, to bury the United States and to build communism in 20 years' time. Communism, of course, was a kind of ideal utopian society, and we believed it. So, uh... At that time, it was uh, really cool to be a Soviet. Then, uh, in 1964, of course, Mr. Khrushchev has been kicked out and replaced by a bunch of much more boring guys. And this is how the decades of so-called stagnation have started. And this is exactly when the Beatles' music started slowly to infiltrate uh, the Soviet mass consciousness. <laughs> and it was then that Kolya Vasin began his long obsession with the Beatles. What's <laughs> Вот я услышал рок н ролл и вот я пробиваю этот железный занавес и выхожу в мир музыки и свободы. Битлз. Вёлт. Ау, вёлт. Here an article about Beatles in Russian press. They say shitting Beatles. Very bad article, very bad article. That's communist, communist. When I saw this article, I say, Soviet is bad state, and uh, I uh, make immigration to free territory of Russia. Uh, in 64 year, I, I say to me, in, in my soul, I will live without Soviets, only in my room with the Beatles. To young people, uh, they uh, say, Beatles is bad. Эстрадный квартет Битлз. Поль Маккартни, Джордж Харрисон. Посмотрите, как они элегантны. 
А в начале своей карьеры четверка выходила на сцену в купальных трусах с сиденьем от унитаза на шее. Вскоре они встретили добрую фею лондонского дельца Бристона Эпштейна. Фея поняла, что из способных ребят можно делать деньги. Зараженные психозом зрители уже ничего не слышат. Истерики, вопли, обморки. Разгромленный зал и драка. Обычный финал концерта. Мир, заключенный в четырех стенах, оклеенный портретом для новолосых певцов. Танцуйте, ребята, танцуйте. Это хороший, веселый танец. Танцуйте и не смотрите по сторонам. Вам до этого нет никакого дела. Валяйте, ребята, валяйте погромче, погорячее. Вам ни до кого нет дела. Fans in search of Beatles music faced serious threats from the Soviet state. Going to the black markets, it was real danger, because if you were caught, and you could be caught every time you are there, because uh, they constantly they organized uh, and special militia, special militia operations, trying to catch people, those who uh, sold and those who bought. Um, and if you were caught with the discs, it automatically meant that you were thrown out from the university. And that is why tape recorders played so important role. You went to the black market together with your friends and you decided, okay, I will buy this disc, you will buy this, you will buy this, then we exchange and we will record it from player to the tape recorder. This is how it worked. And Soviets can do nothing, and it, it was great. <laughs> These tapes, they played a very important role in our history. This is something that uh, hanged the Communist Party of <laughs> Soviet Union. Near the center of Kiev, I came upon unexpected evidence of the Beatles' legacy. The Kiev Cavern Club sent me curious echoes of that cellar in Liverpool where I first met the Fab Four. I started this place because I love the Beatles and I did it mostly for fun. When I started, I think that most of customers will be person over the 40, 50 years. And I make a mistake. A lot of young men come in here and listen to the music. They know all these words of Bill's song. So, a lot of people. Wilbur Katzman told me he actually got the idea for his club after seeing that little film I made in Liverpool. He was only able to open this place after the collapse of communism and he has his own stories of the long years when the Beatles were taboo in the Soviet Union. It was not permitted, it was illegal. There is no Beatles records in the store. Information about Beatles was closed. It was something of a um, different world. I was arrested sometime by Ukrainian, uh, Russian police. They cut my hair, take me along. I don't care. I love Beatles. It was illegal. If something illegal, people must it more and more. It means peace of freedom. And I suppose they changed the world and they destroyed the communism. It must. More than, more than Gorbachev, by the way. They, they changed the Soviet Union. When my mother and father listen at first time Beatles music, they don't like it. Because I, I hear it in maximum volume, and it was, it was very strange for them. They were born in, before revolution, the product of Russia, the product of communism. 
they told me, don't live in this music, teach the mathematics. <laughs> so that's why I wrote this word on, on this wall. And I told to my mother, look at, look at John, look at Paul, he was a poor boy and they became a millionaire. So, and my mother listens to music of Beatles right now and, he li and she likes it. Everything changes. For Beatles superfan Kolya Vasin in St. Petersburg, this is a big day, John Lennon's birthday. For more than 30 years now, Collier and his friends have staged musical celebrations for each of the Beatles' birthdays. For us, that's uh, like uh, native music. Native. That's our music. John Lennon is a Russian man for us. Over almost four decades, Collier Vasin has paid the price of his obsession with the Beatles in his battles with hostile authorities. Денис, а ты вчера еду то по положенку водили? Вот в 60-е годы мы мы говорили или или мне или мне говорили точнее не высовывайся. То есть то есть не лезь туда куда нельзя лезть, иначе тебе дадут по голове, иначе тебя остановят и у тебя будут неприятности. И когда я высовывался, то есть когда я ходил, допустим, на концерты, когда я сам устраивал концерты, когда мы шустрили на черном рынке, это, это все было опасно. Это все действительно было опасно. Painted by my friend. Свободы. Они боялись свободы. Iron Curtain was after Beatles like, like забор с дырками стал. Вот, вот в чем фокус. И мы дышали этим воздухом через этот, через этот забор. И Джордж Харрисон как-то сказал очень хорошо, что мы дали людям надежду. И мы дали людям шанс повеселиться. Мы дали людям шанс забыть, что такое скука. Скука и всякая ерунда по жизни. Тупость всякая, всяческая. Политическая, там, культурная тупость. Everywhere I went, people told me myths about the Beatles. Stung of the real information, kids spun stories about the Fab Four. They swapped fables, which became smudged and fantastic, like the photographs they copied and copied, until they were as mysterious and revered as the Turin Shroud. Louder, you know, in Minsk, Yuri Pelushinok remembers sharing Beatles stories in the schoolyard with his friend Yakov. Everybody who is bringing the like rumor in class, everybody listening to him, and he's enjoying of attention. Do you know that the uh, English Queen gave uh, John Lennon a gold car? It's a pure gold. No, it's not. It couldn't be pure gold because it would be too heavy for John Lennon to escape from his fans. No, it's not. No, it was a silver. No gold. No silver. <laughs> but the most persistent myth is the story of the secret concert. In towns and cities across the Soviet Union, millions of fans, convinced by the song back in the USSR, believe the Beatles' plane touched down near them to refuel on the way to Japan. Then the legend tells how the Fab Four emerged from the plane to play an impromptu concert on the wing. We came to conclusion that Beatles plane probably put on some military airport, not far from here. And we went to see this actual airport where just they were landed. And then a uh, soldier approached and said, what, 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 what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Yes, top secret here. And then there was a Kalashnikov. And we say, oh, we are own people, you know, just don't shoot us, and then just, what, what, what are you doing? So basically, but it was first year soldier, was very condescending to us, and just say, come on, guys, Beatles playing near Leningrad in Pulkova, when, when, when they were landed, and playing on a wing, or playing acoustic guitars. It's shameful not to know this. It was religion, you know, some, some bright light in, in a dreary life. It was quiet revolution in our brains. 
It's something secret. You, you have it in your heart. Like so many other Soviet kids, Andrei Makarevich filled his school books with doodles and daydreams about the Beatles. I'm absolutely sure that it was a lesson of mathematics or something that I hated. And it was very dull. And my hand did it just itself. Makarevich also recalls fantasies about a secret visit to a Moscow hotel by John Lennon. A guy from our school, he spent uh, two days and nights in the bushes without food and water, watching the entrance. And he came back and he said, I saw John Lennon. We had to believe. I knew, you know, schoolboys, people who convinced everyone that they have seen John Lennon on Tverskaya, on Gorky Street. It was called Gorky Street. And uh, I personally seen him buying some bread. We were so crazy that I saw a dream three or four times that Beatles come and I meet them and I show them Moscow. And I even uh, bring them to school and the teachers began to worry. Who are these guys? They're innocent? They're from what country they are? Why long hair? So it was a big scandal. I woke up in a cold sweat. Andrei Makarevich turned his schoolboy dreams into reality, becoming one of the Soviet Union's first rock stars with his band Machina Vremeni, Time Machine. Playing only underground venues, Time Machine became skillful at avoiding police harassment. But they were never filmed until the late 70s, when Russia had moved on to big hair and bad shirts. I can't say that we made music the first two years. We just tried to look like Beatles, to sound like Beatles. But we played every night. We sit in the room and just played. We listened and played, listened and played, listened, tried to sing. And we moved on. Forty years later, Andrei Makarevich and Time Machine were to make a record at the Beatles' Abbey Road Studios. legendary Beatles producer George Martin came to say hello. All you need is love. For his John Lennon birthday party in St. Petersburg, Kolya Vasin has assembled a dozen tribute bands to play once again the music which seduced a generation. Almost 50 years after the Beatles virus first infected the Soviet Union, it lives on in the thousands of bands who still keep the faith and play the old songs. I sometimes had a feeling on my journey that I was slipping in time, lost in an era which is hardly a memory back in my world.
being with that audience in St. Petersburg, it was obvious that the Beatles' songs still connect with kids as well as with their grandparents. But I kept remembering how tough it was for earlier generations to make this music their own. In Minsk, Yuri Pelyushinok decided the only way he could follow the Beatles was to build his own guitar. If you're lucky, you know, have actual photograph of the Beatles guitar, yeah, Beatles guitar, and then you draw it on a, on, a, on a table or something. I saw the table myself, my grandma table. They built all guitars at home or sometimes even in a school shop. You just pretended to build something else. The biggest challenge was to make a pickup to get that rock and roll sound. I think it was a young technician magazine. Someone shared the idea. So how to build the pick up out of telephone receiver. So the next day, receiver's gone. All around the country. It was just like that. No, gone. Then there was the problem of finding a speaker. Propaganda should sound loud. <laughs> if a militiaman or a policeman is not watching you, yeah, you know, you just climb. <laughs> and you have a decent speaker. Equipped with his homemade guitar, Yuri was ready to follow the Beatles to rock and roll heaven. You just hear it and you want to do it. You want to be part of it. You want to be like them. You have never seen them, but you want to be. You join together with your band, you play, and you are happy. Молодые открывали окна, чтобы послышать. Но потом с других подъездов к нам прибегали и говорили, ой, надо ребенка положить спать. А тут такая музыка. Пожалуйста, на 10 минут прекратите эту музыку. Ну, что поделаешь. Вот так вот он и рос с битлами вместе. In Minsk, Yuri Pelushinok brings his band together for the first time in 30 years. Nobody changed too much, uh, except for me. The last uh, time we played in uh, 1978, but we just met in Tolik's apartment. He grabbed guitar, I grabbed guitar, Yakov grabbed uh, this uh, empty canister, and we created this song. And it was quite amazing. As if we just we went for for smoke in 1978, and then we just uh, returned back just 15 minutes later. Yuri wrote a song to recall those days when Soviet kids were hungry to make rock and roll. Подсветочных окон с гитарами за 750 со снятой струной сидели битлами больны и задавали тон всему району пацаны гитарную игрой а если подключить гитару через усилок используя для этого переносной транзистор тогда можно сыграть нечто похожее на рок и бить при этом барабаны из пустых канистр эй не буди гитарой спящий в кручевках люди не поймут здесь гитары твои я выпил себе гитару из доски установил звукач из рубки телефонной но одна тяга струна она распалась на куски когда играл я соло свои песенки коронные эй парень Не будь гитарой, спящий в кружках людей свои песни с припевом. Oh, yeah. You have something in your heart. You don't let anybody to touch it. You know, it's yours. It's official life is going on. It's an official way, and you have an unofficial life. It's a huge separation, it's a huge gap. By the early 70s, Soviet authorities began to waver. It was time to make some cautious compromise with the Beatles' generation, or at least make some money. 
state factories churned out guitars. The state recording monolith Melodia released a few Beatles tracks, identified at first as folk songs played by an anonymous vocal instrumental group. Copyright fees were ignored. The Communist Party went into the bootleg business. Not we won the victory, they lost. And they say, at least we will squeeze some money out of it. Make a virtue of necessity, you know, just... You <laughs> couldn't win, you, you make money. Andrei Tropilo made a reputation in St. Petersburg recording the first Russian rock bands. He funded his passion by making bootleg Beatles records. These days, Tropilo churns out legitimate CDs and DVDs. It's a very clever process. But in Soviet times, Tropilo became a director with the state record company Melodia duplicating Beatles albums for the Soviet masses. Actually, all homes in those times have Beatles records. All homes, believe me. Of course, when I became the melody director, I produced many hundred thousands albums of Beatles. People have right to have it, to use it, to listen. I support not copyright, but copyleft. Because I'm sure that in Russia we should support musical piracy. Because musical piracy was the key to uh, have freedom in Russia, to have free uh, information. Andrei Tropilo confirmed his place in Soviet Beatles mythology by inserting his face into the iconic Sgt. Pepper album sleeve. As Beatles music became more available in the 1970s, Beatles' style began to obsess a generation, ten years after it had faded in the West. They influenced everything. They influenced our music, they influenced our life, our way of living, our dress, how we dress. Uh, they influenced everything, actually. All the hairstyles, you know, cowboy boots and everything. So it was like an amazing power because all the youngsters, all the young people, they started to imitate. They started to feel more free. What was available, a bad quality photos of the Beatles, God knows taking from where, from which album or cover or newspaper and so on. And you can buy this uh, picture for 50 kopecks. And it was a choice either to have a breakfast or to buy this Beatles picture. They wouldn't be able to buy any kind of clothes in Soviet shops. And just with uh, some imagination and a pair of scissors, we would turn uh, an ordinary school jacket into a colorless Beatles jacket. And of course, Lennon's glasses. Lennon's glasses is just fashion, just all 22 square million kilometers of Soviet Union, Lennon's glasses. There were several specially trained guys who would be transforming army boots, real army boots, very heavy and ugly and so on, into some kind of elegant Beatles style. Each and every person who had a guitar and mopped up hairstyle was a Russian Beatle. I was. I was skinny, huge hair, guitar. Paul McCartney playing bass. I spent like two or three hours just trying to stretch my hairs and uh, made myself a haircut to make myself look like Beatles. So not only the boys were copying the Beatles hairstyle, but the girls as well. So it was like a fairy tale and uh, lots of people just having a glimpse, a small uh, window out from the West. By the early 1980s, the gap between the Beatles' generation and their geriatric leaders had become unbridgeable. As the huge country stagnated, millions of young people defected into their own world. 
If we talk about the historical impact of the Beatles, they have alienated a whole generation of young, well-educated, urban Soviet kids from their communist motherland. They wanted to live in an alternative world, consuming alternative culture, pursuing alternative lifestyle. You are a stranger in your own country. You can live behind the Iron Curtain. You can uh, pretend to be a young communist, but at the same time, you can be someone totally different. Liberated by the Beatles, Soviet rock confronted the system. Victor Tsoi's song, Changes, became an anthem for the early 80s. In March 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became the Soviet leader. The man who would be called the USSR's first rock and roll president. I always like to quote the words said by Mikhail Gorbachev. Quote, I do believe the music of the Beatles has taught the young generation of the Soviet Union that there is another life, there is freedom somewhere. And of course this feeling has pushed them towards Perestroika towards the dialogue with the outside world. In the heady days of the late 80s, even Josef Kobzon, for decades the official voice of patriotic socialism, sang Beatles hits. As the Berlin Wall was torn down in November 1989, triggering revolutions across the Soviet Union, the communist empire began to collapse. You can smell that the communism uh, already gone in the Baltic countries, and it's on last legs in, in, in Moscow, Belarus, and uh, Ukraine. So they, they, they say, Let, let's, let's do something interesting for kids, finally. And what would be interesting, Beatles? Well, okay, let's let's make a program. With the help of a school friend who was now working in TV, Yuri recorded the first ever program about the Beatles. He persuaded a Beatles fanatic, Vladimir Savitsky, to share the responsibility. And it was really a surprise for everyone that it was possible. We were so inspired by this opportunity to talk at last about this music. But in the chaos surrounding the collapse of communism, fearful TV bosses wiped the tape before it could be shown. Yuri's friend smuggled a copy to him and 30 Minutes with the Beatles was finally broadcast across the Soviet Union. By then, Yuri had given up on his home country and stowed away on a ship to Canada to start a new life. Since the ending of communism and the collapse of the USSR, the Beatles generation have become grandads and babushkas. The consummation of the 40-year love affair came on May 24, 2003 in Red Square.
across the republics of the former Soviet Union, back in the USSR, is an enduring anthem. For the people who were there when Paul McCartney brought the Beatles music to Red Square, the memory of that night stays with them. It was actually like a huge religious ceremony. Like an USSR. It was like a real holy day. Is it a reality or not? <laughs> or, not? or we are happy that we lived to the time when it became possible. There were rivers and waterfalls of, of tears. Something that sums up your whole life. The Beatles' revolution changed a superpower. And still today, somewhere across the former Soviet Union, someone will be replaying the Beatles one more time. In Gorky Park, Moscow's Krishna community celebrate George Harrison's music. At the Catherine Palace in St. Petersburg, guests arrive for the Pushkin Ball, the social highlight of the year. With music by the Beatles. like talking about what does Pushkin mean to Russian poetry. The Beatles to popular Western and popular music of the world is like saying what are, is Pushkin to Russian literature. On the same evening as the Pushkin Ball, in a St. Petersburg club, a new punk band are playing John Lennon's Power to the People. For their leader, Igor Salnikov, his passion for Lenin is life-changing. It is my plan to change my name into John uh, Lenin, but I have my Russian second name after my father, and so it's going to be uh, John Vladimirovich Lenin. <laughs> In the Ukraine, the peasants of a village called Beatley have relished the accident of their name and adapted their folk songs. In St. Petersburg, Beatles superfan Kolya Vasin is still holding on to his dream of building a temple to John Lennon. He's found his perfect place on the edge of the city. and he's lobbying the city council for funding to make his dream a reality. Человек, который сидит наверху храма, он увидит эту лодочку. Наконец-то! Это он! Это он! Я его узнал! Готовьтесь! Джон подплывет и заплачет от счастья. We all live in the yellow submarine. Yellow submarine. Yellow submarine. I went to Kiev for Paul McCartney's first ever concert in Ukraine. 
In a city where the Fab Four had once been banned and their fans hounded, the arrival of a long-awaited Beatle is bringing thousands onto the streets. I've come to understand that the Beatles mattered far more behind the Iron Curtain than they ever did for us in the West. In the Kiev Beatles Museum, I can feel the force of the repressed yearning which ultimately changed a generation. To celebrate McCartney's arrival, kids from across the country are competing for the best Beatles performance. It's hard to reconcile the freshness and dedication of those kids with the invasion of an international rock spectacular shut away behind its security battalions. I keep thinking about those four lads in a Liverpool cellar long ago. And then it begins to rain. Five hours later, it's still raining. There are fears that Paul McCartney's concert might have to be abandoned. Right away. But she said, I got no time. 